Welcome to season two of Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. This podcast is produced by Beautiful Teaching. Our goal is to immerse you into the beauty of good teaching. Our formative sessions are designed to be live, so you can experience classical education through participating and doing. Join our consultant, Benjamin Lida, who has years of experience in Charlotte Mason schools, traditional classical schools, and homeschooling. Immerse yourself in classical writing lessons, learning rudimentary exercises from the Pro Gymnasmata for eight weeks. This course is ideal and practical for both home educators and classroom teachers. You will come away with a newfound joy and a love of writing that you can extend to your students without purchasing a curriculum. The Pro Gymnasmata is fun, beautiful, and leads to deep and reflective writing like nothing you've ever experienced. The truest to classical writing, the Pro Gymnasmata lays the foundation for formal writing and thinking habits. You can register for this course and see all of the other ones we're offering at beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. Again, beautifulteaching at coursestorm.com. You can also email me at beautifulteaching at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Today, I have Amy Sloan. I uh, have I met her through her podcast that she invited me on, um, what, maybe two years ago, a year ago, called Humility and Doxology. And uh, so we had a really great discussion about Charlotte Mason and classical education. And um, I've gotten to know Amy and wanted to have her share her homeschool journey. I know a lot of our listeners are homeschoolers or are wanting to know more about homeschooling, especially in the classical education world. Um, So I invited her on to share her story and um, her journey about how she became a podcaster, came up with a name for her podcast because it's a great podcast, which I'd love all of our listeners to start listening to Amy's podcast, especially if they're homeschooling and, you know, looking into homeschooling. It's a great resource resource and her website is organized very well. So it's easy to find topics. I really appreciate Amy a lot. So welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Thanks. So just, I'd like you just to let have our listeners get to know you a little bit and share your journey. I think it will be really encouraging for people who are currently homeschooling and people who are considering it. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to get to talk about homeschooling because it has always been a part of my life. I'm actually a second generation homeschooler. So my parents started homeschooling back before it was as well known as it is today, before there were all the resources. You know, now we have so many curriculum options. It's almost overwhelming. But um, one of the things I like to say is that my parents classically educated before it was cool. And I say that now looking back on my own experience as a young learner growing up and realizing how very classical it really was. My mom had been influenced by books like Susan Schaefer Macaulay's um, For the Children's Sake, also by uh, the Greenleaf Press publishers and their encouragement to study a twaddle-free history. That was one of their things that they would talk about. And so when I think back on my early years of home education, we were it was filled with good books, with discussion, with hands-on application, just really seeing how all of the subjects belonged together, that they weren't indistinct little boxes, but were we're all connected. And so being able to see those connections, being able to read so many wonderful books and explore and just really have this wonder just inculcated in my life from the early years was a tremendous blessing. I'm so thankful to my parents for giving me that vision for learning, which was, you know, it was delight to learn. I wanted to always continue learning and the joy of being able to do that together. 
I have one younger brother, four years younger than I am, five grades apart. And our family moved quite a bit. And I think another benefit of homeschooling that I experienced was really being able to have a close relationship with my brother. I think, you know, with that five grade age span, I don't know that we would really have the relationship that we currently do had we been in a more traditional school environment. So I'm, I'm also just so thankful for that. As I grew older and got in my high school years, we were diving more deeply into the humanities and really taking those same things that we had always been doing and just doing them in a deeper, more rich way. And so I, I left home feeling like I had already had this incredible education and one that encouraged me to want to continue to learn uh, as an adult. Something that's kind of a little funny is classical education, like that term was starting to get thrown around a little bit more in my teen years. And so I just thought it was the coolest thing ever and would read all these new books, all the new books that were published on the topic. And as a high school senior, I actually wrote my thesis on classical education, which now I look back and I just, oh, I just can't believe all the dumb things I said. <laughs> Because I was like, wow, well, my parents really failed me because I did not memorize all of this stuff. Mm. And I kind of, you know, bought into what was very popular at the time, this idea of the trivium being ages and stages of learning. And just from all the wisdom of my 17 years, had decided that, you know, really my parents hadn't done all they could have done. And when I was a homeschooler, I was going to keep all the good stuff and, you know, not make any of their mistakes, right? The, the pride of youth. Mm -hmm. But uh, thankfully, the Lord and his goodness and graciousness to me uh, has sanctified me quite a bit as a homeschool mom. And after just kind of starting things early on with my own children, realizing, huh, wow, my, I guess my parents really did have a lot more together than I realized. <laughs> I think we all realize that after we have children. Yes, I'm I'm hoping one day my own children will also have they will. the same realization. <laughs> they will. Mine are. So yeah, it happens. It really does. It's part of the cycle of life. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that that has been something that's been tremendously a benefit of being now a homeschool mom is still having this love of learning, this desire to continue learning myself wanting to pass on this just delight and wonder and enthusiasm for learning just about anything. I mean, I don't have just one thing I want to learn about. Every subject in our family is, is fodder for delight. And um, to be able to do that now as a mom, I'm thankful for the humility that uh, sometimes has come through humiliation, um, that, mm -hmm. that realizing how much I still have left to learn and a willingness to rest in the work of Christ as opposed to my own accomplishments, either as a student or as a teacher, I think has been a real gift now on the home educator side of things. Oh, wow. That was rich. There's a lot there. We got... <laughs> One of the things you said that really struck me that I would like to talk about, because I think it's important for our listeners who are especially, uh, there's both sides of it. The ones who are considering homeschooling or maybe just started homeschooling and feeling really discouraged or those who have been doing it for a long time, but are also tired, burned out, discouraged, and ready to, to, to throw in the towel is the subject of um, the depth of relationships that you get that you give your children in their sibling relationship when you homeschool. I I that was something that was a big factor into why I actually homeschooled is that I wanted I wanted my kids to have a close relationship with each other. My husband and I had found that most of our friendships we had had and this isn't true for everybody but for us it was true when we got married and had kids, we really were in a different phase of life and really were not in connection with any of our friends from elementary, middle school, or high school. And so we had this thought was, well, we should homeschool our kids because then they'll always have each other. You always have your family, whether you want to or not. I mean, you know, and we wanted this idea that our kids would 
not dread when they're adults, not dread getting together for Thanksgiving, not dread getting together for Christmas because there wasn't anything um, familiar with each other. You know, we hear that often in our adult circles of, you know, I don't get along with my sister or my brother and I have to deal with, you know, these arguments that are going to happen at Thanksgiving. And I didn't want that for my kids. And I knew that it's still possible, but I knew that if I homeschooled, it would at least give us a better chance of the kids having a better relationship. So I really am encouraged to hear that that was something that impacted you because I've seen that with my own four kids. They're all adults and they are all close. And we did raise them with the idea, you know, and one of the big things I think that's really difficult as a homeschool mom is the sibling rivalry that you have to deal with all the time when you have your kids home all day. And you just like, I wish my kids were in school because I wouldn't have to hear all of this bickering because it's really, it is a big part of homeschooling. And I remember just always having to tell my kids, well, you know, it's like half the day was wasted. But, you know, I look back now, I'm like, it wasn't a waste, but it felt wasted because everything I had on my list to do that day or that week even was gone because I was dealing with helping the kids figure out how to work through an issue and I didn't want them, you know, I often would leave them kind of to fight on their own, but I also wanted to coach them in the ways of Christ. Like, how do we have a good argument that we can respect each other, you know? And that takes a lot of time and energy to, to do. <laughs> it really does. My, my friend Lena says that homeschooling is parenting intensified, and that resonates with me so much because... It's parenting, but parenting all the time and in all of the school subjects, as well as the family, you know, all of your spheres are connected together suddenly. And so I think there is the one aspect where it's, it's really a gift to us. I have to remind myself of that on the day when I'm tired of dealing with sin, <laughs> whether my children's or my own, right? Um, but it really is a gift to, to not have that be hidden or avoided, but to just have to face it and deal with it. And the many, many times where I, you know, I've cried out to the Lord in front of my children, because mm -hmm. I don't always know how to parent. I don't, I don't know yeah. what I'm doing either. Right. And so for them to, uh, for me to be able to say, guys, mommy needs Jesus. I right. need Jesus. This isn't just something you need. And you need to get your acts together. Like, no, I need Jesus. And so that's a gift um, mm -hmm. to be able to repent to our children um, and, and train them in their own interactions with one another. Um, I do think at the same time it is, and of course, I know you would agree with me here. I think especially as a second generation homeschooler, I always want to reiterate that homeschooling is not a vending machine, right? We don't push the right buttons and get out the right result. I think in my generation of, of like that first generation of homeschoolers, there really was this sort of idea, well, if we just do it all the right way and we do our family structured the right way and our education is done the right way and we just follow all the right rules and we do it right, then our children will be these perfect little products and they'll all love each other and they'll all love Jesus and like that's how we're going to get this thing done. And I think just as a reminder, I mean, because that has not happened. <laughs> right. That I did not happen. And, and right. the Lord yeah. is the yeah. one at work, right? It has to be the spirit who works in our children. You're right. That was a really huge mindset because I remember probably when you were being homeschooled, I was a brand new young mom or just getting married. And I had friends who were homeschooling their kids because a lot of them are your age, I think. So I have, um, I remember that. I remember that mentality. I know exactly what you're talking about. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it kind of sets the mom up for feeling like a failure if her child, you know, decides to walk a different path. And, uh, you know, I've seen that happen and it's re really sad. It's very sad. It either but leads to pride, right? Like, look what a great job I did, like Nebuchadnezzar, right? Like, look at this great kingdom that I have built yeah. or despair because you're like, wow, that did not go the way I thought it would. And both, mm -hmm. both of those are, are just a burden that we're not intended to bear. Um, a friend of mine, Missy Andrews from Center for Lit, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. her, but she wrote a beautiful memoir called My Divine Comedy. 
And it all is dealing with this issue of her looking back as a, you know, homeschool, a retired homeschool mom now and seeing how the idol of what she calls performancism Mm -hmm. was destructive in their family and her life and relationships. Um, and then it's, it's a gracious story as God's stories are, but I highly recommend that book. I think that is still a danger as homeschool moms. We really run into it being this thing that we have to perform and earn God's favor, earn the, you know, the favor of the people around us. And, mm-hmm. um, that's just, that's just going to make you very tired. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's true. It's true. So how are you homeschooling, you know, differently or similarly, to what you were brought up with? So I have five children and that's just one big difference right there. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I have to remind myself when I think of all the like really creative things that my mom did sometimes and like, well, one, I'm a different personality than she is. And also I have a lot more children (laughs) (laughs) because mm-hmm. <laughs> they're kind of like exponential, you know, you don't just add children, you like multiply them. <laughs> um, so my children right now are seven to 17. Um, and so one of the things I think that's definitely similar to my own upbringing is I seek to just bring a joyful, um, delighting in learning to, mm-hmm. to them, both in the younger ages and in the older ages. Um, we have, filled our home with lots and lots of good books, uh, sometimes maybe more than my husband wishes we had, but uh, lots of good books and discussion, really seeking to find the connections between the subjects we're learning and not seeing them as like, you know, you open this book and you study literature, you close that book and you open another one and study history. You know, that, that kind of idea has I reject that completely. Um, So I think those are ways definitely in which I, I have carried on Mm -hmm. uh, the vision for my childhood. I think one thing that is a little different is we probably are a little bit more structured, um, a little bit more. um, I like to have things feel like they're done. I think looking back on my own home education, um, sometimes it felt like we were never done or we were always doing stuff. And so I do like to have, you know, a list where my children know, now we are done. We are finished with this particular thing. Um, We're probably just a, you know, we're a different family. We're a different uh, Mm -hmm. personality as a family. And so we're a little bit more structured in some ways, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I heard you mention when you were sharing your story about being homeschooled, this idea of uh, that you didn't realize you were classically educated But it sounds like what made you realize you were classically educated was realizing that the interconnectedness of subjects is a really key part of what is a classical education, more so than this trivium of stages. So tell us a little bit more about that awakening and and what you discovered. I think as a young mom, as uh, you know, again, someone who loved to read and was eager to pursue this homeschooling thing with my own children, I just started reading and listening to a lot of people. And I think just that was what began kind of transforming the way I thought about education a little bit and, um, and recognizing, I think I, as I read these resources or listened to people talk about Christian classical education. I just recognized my own homeschool experience, essentially. Um, I was like, oh, yeah, this makes sense to me. This is familiar. Like, this is what my education was like. And um, so it was like coming home a little bit. It just felt familiar. And um, began just little by little and imperfect ways seeking to provide that kind of education for my own children. Um, I even before I started my my website, Humility and Doxology, or my podcast, which is Homeschool Conversations with Humility and Doxology, for years back when I was never going to start a blog, for years, I would tell my children, like, this is the end. My goal for your education is that it would lead you to humility and doxology. Those aren't just words that I named my web site for no reason. I had been using those terms with my children. And when I think about humility and doxology, it's really like um, wonder and worship, right? It's this, 
idea of mentor of mine, Dr. George Grant talks about education is repentance. So that first part, like wanting my children to see their place in a bigger world, that it isn't all about them, which I think is a very classical idea, right? Yes. This right. connectedness to a long history of men and women, great thinkers that we approach humbly, ready to listen and not approaching, you know, trying to figure out all the ways they were right or wrong. Um, the idea that I'm a creature. And so I have a place in a world that is under the authority of a creator. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very Christian classical idea, right? And so wanting it to lead to a humility. And then the doxology is like, what's the point of educating my children if at the end of the day, we are not worshiping the one who has created all of these wonderful, amazing things that we're learning about, right? I mean, if you're studying DNA or astronomy or a beautiful piece of art or a great book or just the, the wide sweep of human history, it doesn't matter what you're studying. If you don't come to the end and say, wow, this awe in, in who our great God is. And so those terms, you know, whatever term you use, wonder, worship, humility, doxology, I think that really is the end goal of a Christian classical education. Oh, that's good. Well, yeah, it's about becoming a whole, her, a whole person. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. I know I found that when I homeschooled it, in, when you, when you, when you approach learning, not as a checklist, but as a, what do I get to wonder about today? What do I get to discover today? And you wake up each day anticipating that something will be discovered. It, it's a totally different approach. I mean, and I remember as a homeschool mom, that's how I felt in the mornings, you know? But you know, what was funny is sometimes at the end of the day, what I got to discover that day was that, boy, mom is a pretty angry, impatient person. <laughs> it's not always the, the and there's, so there's the humility, you know? <laughs> and then you praise God. You're like, thank you, Lord. The, you know, I didn't die today. Yeah. Or I didn't kill my children today, right? I mean, you know, yes. not, obviously I'm joking, sure. but you know, that, yeah, homeschooling is hard. I mean, it you really are in the trenches. And so those days when you wake up and you're like, okay, Lord, I surrender today. What am I going to learn today? Sometimes it, it really is at the end of the day, what you learned is that you're not a very patient person. And it's one of the funniest things is so many people will say to you, I could never homeschool. I'm not patient. And I just inside when they say that I'm laughing because I'm like, huh, yeah, neither am I. Like Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but homeschooling is what helps you to realize your incredible desperate need for God. It very much is a very humbling way to spend your day every day. I mean, and you don't get to it's not about you when you homeschool. I mean, you don't get to shower sometimes. You know, it's like when you have a newborn baby. You know, you don't right. get your shower. What's the same thing when you're homeschooling? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think that, you know, I don't mean to communicate. Like, we're just like sitting around wondering and right. delighting <laughs> all the time. And we just, you know always get along. And it's this beautiful picture. You know, of course not. You have just ordinary days. Mostly. You have mostly. Yeah. <laughs> They're mostly just very ordinary, ordinary, maybe even dare I say boring. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> days. It's true. But that's like, that's the, that's what life is like. That's too, life, right? right? Like we're, we're raising humans. Like, and I don't mean in a sense of like, yeah, kids, life's boring, get used to it. But I mean, in the sense of God calls us to very ordinary lives. Most of us uh -huh. very ordinary days and he's glorified in those. And so sometimes it's just being faithful and doing the math sheet when you don't want to is actually something that's much more glorious than maybe we realize. Mm hmm. Yeah. But when you have those days, they're amazing. Like when you have those days where everybody's, you know, clicking along and you discover something together and you as a family and you get to, to me, those days are like when you first watch, get your, you know, you have a baby, your mom, and you get to watch your child take their first steps. It's those, and they're so amazing. And so, and you get many of them throughout the year, I think. And those are those days where you're just like, oh, 
I'm so glad I'm homeschooling because I got to see my child have this light bulb moment, you know? Yeah. And And going back to the sibling thing, like when I hear them, you know, doing inside jokes with Shakespeare or something like that, I'm just like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. It makes my day. I love it. It's so true. It's so true. So you build those relationships and inside your family that are very deep. And uh, yeah, I mean, my kids still quote things from when we were homeschooling, you know? And so we've had to explain some of those quotes to their, you know, their spouses. (laughs) It's like, this is an inside joke and here's why, you know? Exactly. (laughs) It is really, it's really delightful that we get to, that we get to have that. And I do think that having them home helps us to build that. So I know one of the things I'm concerned about, and I want to hear your thoughts on, is a lot of people have started homeschooling because of the pandemic. And you know, they, they started homeschooling because of one, the necessity of it, or two, you know, they began to see their children online with their teachers in schools and realized, wow, this is not what I thought it was. I think I should homeschool because I want my child to have a better education. Those are two good reasons. Another reason that some people maybe started homeschooling is they were afraid, afraid of the germs, the virus itself. And so... I think what I've heard is that some of these parents are really struggling now because they're not really sure how do I keep homeschooling um, or, you know, wanting to throw in the towel. And I, I'd like you to encourage them, like, what would be the right reasons? Because perhaps they started homeschooling out of fear, but what would be maybe a shift in thinking that you could offer to them in why to keep homeschooling? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a big question. I uh-huh. almost want to like sit and think about it. I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to start processing externally and hopefully I won't say anything too terrible. But I think I think asking, having a why is really important because mm-hmm. on those hard days, if you don't have a really good why, why am I doing this? It's, it's not going to be easy to persevere. So just asking the question first is probably a good first step. Why am I doing this? What is my goal? Um, I think a really good question to ask is what kind of human being do I want to raise? Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, when my child leaves home and they go off to be an adult, what kind of human do I want them to be? And that's, you know, can include academic things, certainly. But I think a lot of times those are going to be non-academic answers that we're going to give. And so um, I think if you start asking those kinds of questions, it will help bring clarity to, okay, if that's my end goal, this sort of big picture idea, how does that then trickle back down to the decision I'm going to make today? You know, what kind of education is going to help me best foster those character qualities I want in my child? Mm -hmm. Um, I like to even think about this question every year before I start planning my homeschool or, you know, buying curriculum. I think it's just helpful to, to re-examine those kinds of questions, refresh yourself on them because, you know, in the day to day, you just sort of get, you just like want to check the boxes a lot of times, even though that's not your ideal, but like your daily life sometimes just gets you in the grind. And so revisiting those big picture goals, I think is really helpful, whether you're a long-term homeschooler or not. And then I think also I would just encourage you know, parents who maybe are are in that situation, it's okay if you don't have it all figured out. Like right. I don't have it all figured out and I'm a second generation homeschooler. Like That's true. I still don't have it all figured out. And some of that is because my children change year by year, their needs change. Mm-hmm. So even if you had it all figured out somehow magically this year, next year, it's going to face new challenges. Something is going to come up and yeah. Being flexible love, is part of it. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that because what a lot of parents don't realize it is that most schools don't have it all figured out either. And we can tell, like even classical schools, because you're dealing with boards and par- and all different parents, all different teachers. And a lot of the teachers are brand new. And I'm not, I don't want to bash schools because I, I mean, I think especially classical schools, there's so many good schools out there. But to throw in the towel for homeschooling because you don't feel like you have it all together, well, then you might as well not send them to any school either because they don't either. Yeah. You know, it's true. It's true. That's that's a really, really good point. Um, 
And you just kind of have to learn along the way and you learn alongside your Mm -hmm. children and you show them what it looks like to be a learner. Yeah. And you love your children so very much. I don't think there's anyone as motivated to do a good job Mm -hmm. as a, as a parent. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is not to say that other teachers are not also loving your children and and motivated to, to um, equip them as well, of course. But when you think about the love you have that mama bear instinct, you will jump through whatever hoops you need to, to figure out and a solution to whatever problem you're facing. And so Mm -hmm. Just, just remembering that your your very love for your children is also is is a tool in your toolbox. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about ho- the different options of homeschooling and curriculum. Like, so the parent who feels like, well, I don't know, I don't remember algebra well enough to teach that, or uh, I could never teach all the subjects in all the grades, you know, for my kids. Um. What, what do you think, what would you say to that person? Because you've got a lot of kids, different ages. Yeah. Um, so I think it's one thing it's good to remember is that um, what the Lord is calling you to, he will provide for you. And so um, that may look like outsourcing classes. We have outsourced some classes, both in person and online over the years for different reasons for different children. And that is, I am so thankful that we're able to do that. I have friends who have graduated four children from high school, um, a homeschooling high school, and have never outsourced classes. It wasn't in their family budget. Mm-hmm. And the Lord provided for them there as well. There are so there's, many. There's a lot of good curriculum out there yeah. that allowed you to do that. I didn't outsource very much either. I did some, but I didn't really outsource until my kids were in high school because really up to high school, I mean you read a lot of books together. You talk about the books and there really isn't a need to outsource that. And I would say even like sometimes, so I did teach pre-calculus to my uh, my oldest son, although I'm outsourcing it with my daughter (laughs) just for the sake of time. But um, when I did that with my son, I didn't remember all the things I had ever learned from pre-calculus and trigonometry. It had been a few years. And so I could both use the teacher book but sometimes I still couldn't remember. So that's where I got to model for him. Hey, we don't understand how to work this problem. Let's research and figure it out. Exactly. And so being able to tell your child, I don't know the answer to that question. Let's figure it out. That's actually teaching them an incredibly valuable skill because, you know, as they are an adult, whether they're going to higher education or just living their life, there are going to be a lot of things that come up that you're like, I don't know how to do that. But let me figure it out, right? I also worked part-time when my kids were in high school. And I remember saying, well, if you can't figure it out, here are some resources you can use to go learn. And after you learn it, I want you to come teach it to me. And that was a great way for them to take ownership of learning it. And then if they had, if they could teach it to me, it meant they, they knew it. So that was something, I mean, and I did, I worked part-time and I did it. So it's doable. It's very doable when you work part time, and you work part time because you run this podcast and blog. So when you do that, you do it. It is really nice to have some of those outsourcing. Yeah, uh, and things. there are so many more homeschool parents around now that if you if it's not financially feasible to outsource, look around at the people you know who may be willing to swap things like. I have loved teaching logic to to fellow students when I'm teaching my own children because it's just more fun if you can talk Mm -hmm. about that kind of thing with with your peers. Um, But look for someone who's maybe really good at math and maybe you're really good at literature and say, hey, you want to swap this, you know, swap this. It doesn't have to be a formal co-op. That's right. Everybody now is like looking for a a co-op that like teaches every single subject. But back in the day, yeah, (laughs) we just would like do stuff that worked for individual families. You had smaller, more organic communities and um, you were able to be a lot more flexible that way too. So don't be afraid to just make up your own thing in your living room. That's really true. I love that. I love that. Um, Let's see, what else can we talk about to help encourage homeschoolers? There's a lot. This is a huge topic. I would love some of the listeners to actually post questions on our Facebook page. And maybe you and I, once they do that, can get in there and answer some of those questions too. Because yeah, I'm sure it. it's been so long since I've homeschooled. And, and it's a different world today that I'm like, 
I'm sure that the, I know that the challenges you guys are facing is a lot different than what I was facing. Um, very different. And you have way more options. Like I did, I did end up homeschooling Charlotte Mason, but I, that's not where I started. I pulled my kids out of public school and started really just with uh, some of the teachers sent home the workbooks the kids had. I was like, okay, we're just going to do those. We're going to go outside and look at trees and we're going to draw leaves and we're going to, you know, research the 50 states, you know, <laughs> I got to figure out what I want. Cause I didn't know. And, uh, and then I had a mom, a young mom say to me, well, don't waste your money on curriculum until you know what your philosophy is. And I was like, what do you mean what my philosophy is? I don't, there's a philosophy of education. Like I had no idea, which is silly that I didn't know that because I went to Montessori school as a child. Then I went to public school. So my mom obviously knew there were different philosophies and she found Montessori, <laughs> but I somehow never knew that and just didn't even dawn on me. And so then I was like, well, what do you mean educational philosophy? So I started looking at all the different homeschool options. And that's when I got somebody said, oh, you have to read for the children's sake, which is a, you know, that's the gateway drug for everybody that goes into Charlotte Mason. Yes. That, that book. And, uh, and then I was like, wow, this is great. And I ended up starting off the kind of literature approach to learning more with sunlight. Cause it was like, oh, it's boxed. All the books have cho been chosen. There's a checklist, there's questions. But the more I started reading Charlotte Mason, we didn't have podcasts. We didn't have, you know, Ambleside Online was just brand new and it was being piloted. And I happened to meet a lady that was part of the pilot. And the website was very clunky. It was, you know, not even really officially launched. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go with sunlight. <laughs> And so, you know, but as Ambleside developed, I began finding myself tossing aside some of my sunlight books for the Ambleside books. And as I was reading Charlotte Mason volume six, which is where I started with volume six, I began to, you know, realize how different it was. And, uh, and so that's, that was kind of like, then I switched all to Ambleside online, but you know what, even if you don't know exactly what you want, you can dive in and learn how to swim, you know? And there will be people who will come along and throw you some life jackets. <laughs> yes. And I think it's just good to remember with all the options we have available now, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that to pick the perfect True. curriculum. And there's no way that can and, happen. And no. there is no perfect curriculum, right? No. Like that doesn't exist. That's a myth. And then you don't, I mean, just don't go in a group and be like, what should I use for math? Because then you're just going to get like 27 people who all tell you different things. And they're all very it's adamant so that true. their way is the right way. I mean, it, it can just feel really overwhelming. So just remember true. there is no perfect curriculum. I really think that faithful consistency, the simple thing that you do, is better than trying to find some perfect thing and then you never get started or you like sprint out and then it fizzles. Like don't underestimate just doing something simple and doing it every day. That's true. In fact, one of the things that helped me pick a math curriculum was I needed to understand the teacher guide. This is way back and I'm sure maybe revisions have happened, but when I picked up the kindergarten Saxon teacher guide and I was like, I don't even understand the teacher guide. How could I teach kindergarten if I don't understand the teacher guide? Saxon was out for me, you know? And for me, Matthew C made sense. And so that's what I went with. I understood it. And then later I realized, you know what? I'm not, I don't love it so much. And I switched to right start math. And I love right start math. But you know, it's okay. You find along the way and you figure out what's working. And like you said, you know, I think you definitely want to pick up at least maybe four or five different samples of teacher guides if you can get your hands on four or five and start with the teacher guide. Do I understand this? Do I agree with this approach? Does it make sense to me? Oh, that's a good question, Amy. What books do you think we should tell parents to, to read to help Ooh. them, to help them figure out if homeschooling is right for them? Are there any new books out? Anything? I mean, hmm. well, I really recommend, let's see. I mentioned the book by Missy Andrews. I mm -hmm. recommend her my divine comedy. I really love, this isn't ex just for homeschoolers, but I adore the liberal arts tradition yes. um, by Jane and Clark. Like, yes, my, I just love that book. If you're wanting to understand uh, classical education, highly recommend I that agree. One. I agree. Um, I really, let's see, I feel like I'm going to end up like missing something really important. I do think that um, Better Together by Pam Barnhill is a great book. Um, 
Teaching from Rest by Sarah McKenzie. You know, those are great books. I think those are all kind of, I'm a big picture thinker. So these are all sort of like bird's eye view, big picture. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as like practical uh, daily, here's what homeschooling looks like. I think the kind of um, current thing really is podcasters like me. So you should check out yeah. the Homeschool Conversations podcast. <laughs> it's true. You do have a lot of resources on your podcast. It's so true. It's true. And you kind of, I mean, you really cover a vast amount of topics. Yeah, you know, I really have yeah, enjoyed interviewing all these different people because when, and I, a lot of them, I'll, I ask a lot of the same questions to every guest and that's on purpose because I think it's really helpful to hear how different families do things a little bit differently, but they're all providing wonderful educations for their children. So that can well, be helpful. Off the top of your head, can you think of three or four good ones for people to start with? from your podcast episodes, like interviews that you think would really help somebody trying to figure out if they want to homeschool? Okay, let's see. Well, I would really recommend my interview with Dr. George Grant. That was one of the very first ones I did. Um, he had a tremendous impact on the way I think about education. So I really recommend that one. Um, if you are homeschooling high schoolers, I would recommend uh, the interview I did with Ann Carrico and also the interview I did with Jamie Marstall. I think you know Jamie, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she talked about specifically about Charlotte Mason High School. Um, and then Ann just sort of demystifies it and mm -hmm. makes it not be so scary. I appreciate her a lot. <laughs> Um, and then I would recommend uh, a recent interview I did with Pam Barnhill and Heather Tully talking about the value of gathering together as a whole family. People call this time different things, morning basket, morning time, circle time, gathering. But um, I interviewed the two of them uh, just talking about the value of that and why it matters in our homeschool. And it's been a, a huge blessing in my own homeschool. Um, and so I think, I guess those would be the ones that come to mind right away. Although I'm going to get off of this and be like, oh man, I, I should have mentioned this other one. <laughs> I've interviewed you. I've interviewed Karen Glass, Cindy Rollins. Like there's so many good ones. Yeah. 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 Well, this is kind of like a getting started. I think people, yeah. it's helpful. Yeah. And if you think of others, you can always post it on our Facebook page. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's close out the interview with our final question. Um, I, we always ask our interviewer, our, our guest, what is a quote from a book that has had a huge impact on you or what book do you wish you had read sooner in your life? I know you want to share a quote. Yes, I am so excited because um, this sort of brings together everything we've been talking about. Uh, when I was a teen, I was first introduced to G.K. Chesterton, became completely obsessed with Chesterton, so much so that some of my friends started calling me Mrs. Chesterton. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are worse things to be obsessed with, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so this is actually, you know, I'm holding my same copy of Orthodoxy from when I was a teen. I've read it so many times since then, along with his other works. And um, it's really fun to look through and see how many different things are underlined. Different times when I read the book, different things stand out to me. Probably by the time I'm 50, the entire book will be underlined. But anyway. That's um, how my Charlotte Mason book is, volume six. <laughs> yes. So I actually, I knew I wanted to pick a quote from Orthodoxy because I think it's a book every educator, every human being should read. Um, but I was like, man, how am I going to pick a quote? And I was like, well, I mean, it's so underlined. I'll just sort of open up and see what I glance down and notice. <laughs> And um, in God's providence, it was went along perfectly with what we've talked about, about humility. And um, so this is from chapter three in Orthodoxy, which is entitled The Suicide of Thought. And this is what Chesterton says. What we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. Modesty has moved from the organ of ambition. Modesty has settled upon the organ of conviction, where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, the part of a man that a man does assert is exactly the part he ought not to assert himself. The part he doubts is exactly the part he ought not to doubt, the divine reason. Huxley preached a humility content to learn from nature, 
but the new skeptic is so humble that he doubts if he can even learn. Thus, we should be wrong. If we had said hastily, there is no humility typical of our time. The truth is there is a real humility typical of our time, but it so happens that it is practically a more poisonous humility than the wildest prostrations of the ascetic. The old humility was a spur that prevented a man from stopping, not a nail in his boot that prevented him from going on. For the old humility made a man doubtful about his efforts, which might make him work harder. But the new humility makes a man doubtful about his aims, which will make him stop working altogether. Wow. So I know that's a little bit of a long one, but I mean, nobody says it like Chesterton. No, that's really good. Hard work, working hard. Don't stop yeah. working hard. Don't get so discouraged. Yeah. yeah. And the humility of education coming not from doubting that there is such a thing as truth or doubting whether what we're doing matters, but um, resting in an eternal, an eternal truth of what we're doing matters. Right. Um, and then not doubting, not doubting that ultimate end. That's really good. That's really good. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. Yeah. And I will have in the show notes uh, Amy, a link to Amy's website. And actually, I'll put links to each one of those episodes she recommended and, of course, all the books. So, all thanks. right. Sounds great. Thank you for having me, Adrian. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, Well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven. <laughs>